All right, John, welcome back to Wicked Smart Golf, the first three-peat guest. Appreciate you being here. Oh, I'm excited to be back here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, for those of you guys that don't know, actually, I announced it, I believe, on social media. If not, I will. But I uh, wanted to give John a shout out. He was the most shared episode uh, last year. So obviously it helped grow the podcast. I know a lot of you guys obviously were sending that to family and friends. So thank you again, John, for uh, sharing so much wisdom with us and uh, hopefully understanding that mental game a little bit more. Well, that's really exciting news. And uh, thanks for everybody out there spreading the word. That's uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, it's just so cool to have that kind of custom way to go through mental golf type and understand how to play based on your personality. And that's really the difference between you and really most of the other systems out there. And so before we get into some of the specific topics for today, if you could just give a quick overview, we've had a lot of new people uh, start listening to the podcast, uh, just a quick little summary of what is mental golf type. And um, I'll link to the other episodes that we've done with John below too. Sure. Uh, mental golf type, you could think of it kind of like a mental fitting. I mean, nobody's going to go into a the golf store or sporting goods store and just grab some random clubs. You get them fit to your body and your swing speed and all those specifications. Um, our approach has always been to try to match people and figure out exactly how their mind's set up so that we can key them in on what to do to bring out their best. Um, so mental golf type determines which of the 16 mental golf types you are. And once you go through that assessment, you start keying in on what your natural mental strengths are and also what's going to produce stress for you. And believe it or not, uh, it's subtle mental stress that's creating the inconsistencies in players' performance because stress and this mental stress is going to create cortisol. It's going to spike adrenaline in your body. And the cortisol acts like a paralytic. So it's going to clamp down on your motor cortex and uh, that's going to inhibit your golf swing. And believe it or not, once you start being aware of some of these subtle stressors in your game and gearing your game towards your natural gifts, we see that lifted. We see more of your physical capabilities and talent coming out on the course. And everybody seems to be performing much, much better. Yeah, and it, it's so funny because I think a lot of people might start to understand their personality type a little bit without actually even going through it. And they can, once they do that free self-assessment, and guys, we definitely want to do that. I'll link to it down in the show notes. But it's funny because like when you take the self-assessment, I've had so many of my one-on-one -on -one mental coaching students uh, tell me like, is, does John know me? Like, how, how is he so accurate? Uh, just because you have really understood what each personality type does and how they perform the best and what stresses them out. And people start to maybe understand that if you play a lot of golf, like for example, I think obviously the easiest one we always give is extroverted versus introvert. You know, I'm a massive extrovert. Um, well, I'd say ambivert these days, but mostly an extrovert on the golf course. And it's one of those things where when I'm talking, when I'm you know, staying present and with my competitors and I'm talking and like looking at the squirrel and, and different things, that's when I play my best. It's when I get emotional, put my head down, stop talking to people. That's when I play my worst. And I knew that, I think, it, to a sense. But when I went through mental golf type in August of 2022, I realized instantly, like, wow, okay, we, even if we're playing bad, we got to stay chatty. We got to make sure we're doing things that you mentioned inside the program to stay out of stress. Because basically, stress is the inhibitor of the zone. Is that right? Yeah, 100%. And, and the goal of our program wasn't to teach players to do anything new. We don't want to actually make you stretch or create stress. What our goal was, was to teach you actually what you do and what you do when you're performing well and what you do whenever you're performing poorly. And believe it or not, I mean, we do key in on some of these things about our personality, but we never make the link up to how it's actually influencing our performance and what that's doing to the part of our brain that is responsible for our golf swing. And believe it or not, um, most people aren't even aware of their mental strengths because we make the assumption in life that everybody is doing things the way that we do. And our gifts are so natural. We do them so effortlessly that we just assume that that's how everybody does it. So what helps with mental golf type and keying in on that is go, oh, that is actually my strength. And our minds are set up with like a right and a left hand. One's going to be dominant and one's going to be inferior. And sometimes it's a matter of getting that assurance to say like, yeah, this is my strength. This is actually what I do. And then as you start going through your history and start recalling events, you go, yeah, now I'm starting to see the connection. And this has flown under the radar of golfers since the conception of the game. And it's the subtle stress. I mean, you know, whenever acute stress is there, uh, you had a really good run last year. You were in a lot of big moments pushing for the lead. 
Um, when you're in those big moments, you know you have to tend to yourself. It's obvious. Your heart's beating. You might have your hands shaking, and it's like, whoa, I got to get myself into a good place to perform. But it's the subtle stress that's flying under the radar. And every golfer's had the experience of hitting it good during their warm-up to only to walk to the first tee to struggle. Your motion isn't breaking down that much, um, or it doesn't change that fast. What's changing is the mentality. And if that's happening for you, what's happening is that mentality shift is actually creating stress on your motor cortex that changes your golf swing. And we know this is true because when you get off the course that day or you finally let go of the consequence or threat that you were kind of holding on to, whether oh, I don't want to be embarrassed or uh, what if I score bad or whatever these imagined threats are, once that's gone, the motor cortex is, releases that stress and the swing's right back there on the range. And this can even happen mid-round. It can happen during sections of the round. But this is where those performance changes are primarily happening. But yeah, what stresses just, you might be different than me. And again, that right. goes back to we have to now look at the subjective nature. And uh, believe it or not, uh, what Carl Jung had identified in 1921, which now has over 100 years of research and, and data backing uh, personality, um, we're now starting to really see that interplay and especially how it's affecting us performance wise. Yeah. I think the best example, I don't know if it was from your old podcast that you had, which was, oh, was awesome. I remember binging all those a couple of summers ago and I think it was either in there or maybe it was a different podcast you were on, but you talked about how that's why people practice so much better than they play casual rounds. And that's why casual rounds are so much better than tournament rounds. So basically that's why you can be a great range player. And then all of a sudden your game disappears on the golf course. I know we talk about practice and how Practicing on the range is very different than a golf course, obviously, with lies and uh, consequences, things like that. But it, it seems like stress is the real breakdown from why you're a range player versus why you're struggling on the course. Is that right? Correct. Or you may be applying a learned behavior rather than more of a natural behavior. So uh, a real common thing is, is the majority of golfers are sensing players. And we have two different types of ways we can focus. We can be a sensor or an intuitive. And again, we do both, but one's going to be very dominant. Sensing players do really well when they're focused on alignment and a simple concrete action or a feel. And when they're on the range, you typically see them with an alignment rod. They're working on what their coach does, and they're just putting their full attention to that one action. And what do you see? Flush, flush, flush. Mm -hmm. um, stripe shows happening. Then they've been taught through reading sports psychology books or something that says, now you got to go to the course and get more target oriented. Yeah. And so now we already have a disconnect because getting more target oriented is using a different part of the mind versus or the personality or mind for the focus. It's getting away from a linear uh, one plus one equals two mentality. And it's starting with the end in mind. And what happens to that sensor is, is as they start getting in more into the outcome, more into the target, they're getting more into the big picture of the shot. And so they start losing touch with some of the details those normal one, two, three to get the job done. And as a result, the performance is changing. So those subtle shifts or believing like, hey, I need to go out and do this. It could be working against you and you can learn to get better at it, but it's still going to create more mental activity and the performance is not going to be as good. I'll give you an example. So everybody listening at home, if you get out a sheet of paper and a pen, sign your name with your dominant hand. Notice the performance. What does it feel like to you? Most people tell me it's easy, effortless, felt natural, smooth. Um, it's simple. And then we look at the result. The result's really clean. Now put it into your inferior hand and sign your name again. Notice the performance. It takes more work, more effort, more concentration. Uh, it's more tedious. It's more mechanical. Um, so much more effort to produce a mediocre result. So when you compare the two, it's like, wow, one simple and easy produces a good result. The other takes more work, more effort to produce a mediocre. And so if we're going onto the course and you're feeling like you're struggling, you're grinding and you're, it's like you're producing mediocre, but you're putting a lot of effort. It's likely that you're employing a learned behavior. And so there's more activity, more stress in the brain and your physical talents just weren't going to be released in the same way as if you were aligned with your natural strength. 
And this yeah, all and happens the other way too with intuitives, Michael. Um, yeah. You might be on the range. You have a big range. You have a lot of freedom. You feel like there's space. We can shape the ball. We have a lot of command. And then the intuitive players oftentimes get to the course and now feel like, okay, now I got to guide it. Now yeah. I really got to be precise to hit this real specific target. Guilty. And as they get specific, they're going to get more mechanical. And again, here's that extra stress. We're now losing touch with the big picture and we're into the little details. And so aligning with the way you perceive the world naturally or the way you focus is so crucial to mm -hmm. releasing your physical talents. It's that's yes. what's going to bring out all the hard work on the range. I'm so glad you said that because that that is a perfect example because I am uh, an intuitive and I there's some desert golf courses here and it feels like I'm suffocating. And I, I know I have room to improve, especially on a desert tee box, a desert golf course with an elevated tee box. Cause then it's like, it feels wide open, but you see that it's not. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, a always an interesting one for me. So one thing that I learned from you and that I just experimented was different ways to visualize since we're on that, because I think that that is a, a really important one. Um, what are the different ways to visualize or how does visualizing versus verbalizing work? Cause I've, I've tried a bunch of different ones from you now, but I think most people think visualizing is like the Jack Nicholas. You got to see it in your mind. It's a perfect shot, like a shot tracer, but there are other ways that still will help your brain calm down and be able to execute the shot. What, what are some other ways that players can think about it? I know last year or when we talked for putting, you said like you could imagine a, a Batman or your favorite character in, in front of the cup and that could be going down. What are some ways for the full shot to help visualize and get yourself mentally prepared to execute? Sure. So if you're a sensing player, um, ideally we want to visualize as clear as we can for Pro Tracer. And that's about seventy-five uh, percent, right? Of that's going to be the most. But okay. here's where I'd say: if you're a sensor, your visualization should be the last step of your decision making. Mm. It isn't something that we're necessarily doing. The closer we're getting to the ball, for a sensor, we want to get clear, specific on one shot. When they're at their best, it's like going through vertical blinds or seeing target. Hey, here's my flight. It's clear. It's one flight. So the clearer they get, it gets them into their move, into that concrete action, and it progresses the rest of their routine really nicely. The one thing I'm glad you brought up that Jack Nicholas quote, because it's a famous quote that a lot of mental game coaches talk about, but it's chopped off at the end. So Jack Nicholas, I believe, is an ISTJ. And he says, yeah, I never hit a shot, not even in practice, till I have a really clear picture. Okay, so here's it getting specific, right? Yeah. I can see the flight, the trajectory, where it's going to land, how it's going to react, so that I can determine what I need to do in my swing. So he's mm -hmm. still taking it. So the clearer he gets, the easier it is to go, oh, I know my move. To produce that, I need to aim right, and I need to do this. So he Tiger, would say, okay, this is a high draw. And then he thinks about his one concrete swing thought to create that high draw. Correct. And then it went mm. linear. And so again, here we're seeing it in the decision-making process for the sensors. And that's when we're at the best because the rest of the routine becomes very linear. Now, you know, your one move, you're rehearsing that one move, and then we're getting that address and it's a simple equation. If I aim right and I do this, that has to happen. And now we have this nice linear way to a very specific goal. So if you're a sensor, try to get more specific. If you struggle to visualize, verbalizing can help. I mean, just articulating what you want to do with the shot will generate a really good mental picture, um, especially for an extrovert. It's going to organize your thinking. It's going to keep you out of those avoidance terms. That's going to produce a negative picture. And uh, it'll help kind of direct the mind. So if you're not good at visualizing or Sometimes people don't like the term, but think about it, imagining it. It's all doing mm -hmm. the same thing um, or verbalize to visualize. Now, if you're – I'll just stay on the sensor for a moment. When you're at commitment line, what I like sensors sometimes to visualize is them executing their move, the confident swing happening, stepping right into that swing. They They can do that too. Nicholas, I remember reading in his book, he had a really weird visual – for his swing. And it was all technical related. He didn't want his hands to run away. 
And so he would imagine, I don't know if it was samurai swords or a wall of razor blades that would like cut his hand if his hands ran away. Again, that's a player side visualization to help a sensor. Again, what's he visualizing to keep his hands and, you know, it's all swing related. Sensors could visualize the training aids. Um, Austin used to talk about getting into his swing station. And at Mike Bender's, there was this green wall. And he used to do his work right behind this wall in the drills. And when he was there, it was his alignment rod, this station. It was like his, his little sanctuary. So I remember us being at the Honda Classic in the bear trap. We talked about like diving below the waves in that calm space and just getting into the swing station, using that breath to step into that place. And he hit it on 15 to three feet, made birdie there. I think he played the bear trap two under over two days, nice. which was really good. But those would be more kind of sensor based. Um, I'm less into the visualization with the sensors as long as the it's happening in their decision making. Okay. So yeah, you like the move, like having a move more or uh, picturing like a specific shot and then a, maybe a move or a swing thought that can help with that. And then intuitives are going to well, be Well, even very... the sensors, just the last thing is, is, is recall is going to be really good for sensors. Sensors Using pass shots to draw from the reference bank because mm -hmm. they could be sitting at the commitment line and it's a, it's a nervy shot. Let's just say you got to hit a rope of four iron over some water to a long par three. This, a lot of sensors are going to do well by going back into the reference bank and, and just recalling a confident swing with their four iron. Mm -hmm. It's still producing that same type of linear process. And, and for sensors, it's easier to draw from the experiences and bring it to the moment than necessarily create a new vision of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have a lot of certainty by applying something from the past. So, Recall, talking about even a good shot when you felt confident, step in, there's already a great picture inside of the mind. As far as intuitives go, there's a lot of different ways you can visualize. Um, so as we start talking like getting more target dominant, you could be holding the target in mind, just simply getting the eyes up and engaging the target for a two or three second period for an end is naturally making the picture. The brain's naturally connecting the dots. And so just engaging with the eyes. Um, but I tend to like a lot of open-ended visualization. For myself personally, I'm an ENFP. I tend to play towards apex windows. I don't really see completed shots. Um, my mind doesn't work really that way. I see it open-ended. So for me, the key visualization is where my apex of my flight is. So I tend to use apex windows or shaping windows. And I'm like, okay, upper right corner. I want to see that thing curving down. And if it hits anywhere in that frame, it's going to find my zone ultimately. So you Even imagine like it, a tiger nine shot drill kind of of where your ball would be going through one of those nine. Is that what you mean? Or Well, think about this. When you really get up there and I've seen your Instagram, when you flush one off the tee, do you really look at it? No. I, it's, Oftentimes, that's funny. Yeah. it hits that apex window. You go, that's money. Pick up the yep. T and you go. Okay, a yeah. lot of people do. So okay. for me, that's that's the extent of my visualizing because it's open-ended. Uh -huh. I'm like, okay, I don't need to control it. I need to get my apex somewhere within this window. And if mm, it leaks a little okay. left, a little right, it's going to drop right to where I want it to be. Mm -hmm. Other people can bring it a little closer to them and have more of a launch area, you know, launching okay. it around the, the poles. Um, but there's so many different creative ways to visualize. Yeah. If you're really stressing, you can go like the cartoon route that you brought up. I've worked with many juniors, college players, even adults where they would have, you know, Scooby-Doo, Batman standing in the middle of the fairway with this huge catcher's mitt and you're just firing the ball to the mitt. And, uh, we've done that in putting, um, all kinds of different things. So if you're a sensor, look at what are the creative ways and what are you getting from you know, your drills and some of those swing stations you create. Can you visualize that to help it? Can you visualize the swing stepping into that? Or if you want to be ball flight related as a sensor, get specific. As an N, get more target based. Experiment with connecting with the target. Bring it back to you. Hold it in mind. Uh, last visualization, honestly, that I love for Ns is you imagine like looking out of your ear. 
and you're just keeping your ear on the target. And if you're like a little telescope or something in there, like what would my ear be looking at? And it's engaging the target. And as it's doing that, it's keeping target in my mind and I'm able to make my swing. But sorry to be rambling, but those are a number of different strategies. If you're an N, experiment with how far out you like. Are you one that can mm -hmm. see completion? If so, play to a nice big zone in an area out there. If you're more like me, apex windows. I used to imagine plate glass with my driver, and I just wanted to break through the glass. It was a great visual. I see glass going all over the fairway. Um, those things really helped to get me out and get target oriented. Yeah, no, I appreciate you expanding on that because I remember when I first started reading sports psychology books and, you know, even just understanding that, yeah, visualization is a great way to pray. Basically, your mind doesn't know the difference between what's real and imagined. And I could totally see, you know, Jason Day is closing his eyes. You hear Tiger talk about it. But I just always felt like my mind was broken because I could never see that one way. And so that's why I wanted you to expand upon it. So if there's other people out there that can't see a line or, you know, don't have this amazing picture that there are other ways to do it, that's going to help just as much. And verbalizing as an extrovert, I love that. I, that one to me is great. Um, I think that's why some players struggle with a caddy too sometimes is because all of a sudden now you're talking it out. And if you're not a talkative person, that can, that can be weird or vice versa. But yeah, when I, when I had a caddy for an event, I go up to an Oregon, it's like my family friend, we were talking shots out and I played lights out that day. I mean, like, I don't know if I hit a bad shot. I smoked the guy like five and four. It was easy. It was effortless. And, uh, it was one of those where I didn't even know about, um, mental golf. This was 2021. And, but I look back to that. I'm like, Oh, that was, you can see it happening. And so, some of your best rounds and, and not even realizing it. It's interesting because Austin's an introvert and we, we don't talk because that would derail him. We, right. we do our math. We arrive at the shot and we do our math simultaneously. And I don't talk until he will verbalize his number because okay, um, if I get in there too early, it's stopping his flow of thought as a, as an introvert, you know, I'm kind of mm -hmm. getting into his space a little bit. So definitely. Yeah. I really yeah, want to learn. Point. Yeah, I want to learn more about that uh, in just a second because I think Q school and just high level competition, people are just uh, love to learn about that and love to feel like how they can get that in their games. I feel like the last two letters of uh, the personality type we haven't given as much love to. The first episode we really covered the the extrovert versus introvert. Um, we did a lot of sensors and target or intuitives. Um, when it comes to feelers versus thinkers, I uh, I really like this one too because. I feel like I am such a logical person that I, whenever I try to play on emotion and go against that, um, bad things usually happen. So can you just kind of explain the difference between the two types and uh, a couple of uh, general ways to play your best if you took that assessment and, and came back as that? Sure. So um, thinking and feeling are determining what is our dominant preference for decision making or how we actually are evaluating because evaluation of your world and what's going on around you, like how's my day going? That's a decision. Mm -hmm. um, so that goes into this TNF. Now, everybody thinks and has cognition. Everybody has emotion and feels. Um, Carl Jung was actually talking more about thinking as more of utilizing your logical or analytical intelligence versus your emotional or kind of relationship intelligence. So thinkers are more analytical dominant people. They're going to primarily arrive at their decisions by using analysis of some kind, whether it's pros and cons, whether it's looking at data points, um, breaking down percentages. Um, so this would very, be, this is something we're doing behind the golf ball. I just want to kind of give people like an example. So like you get behind the golf ball and you're, you're starting to figure out, Hey, I got 150. Uh, there's a bunker. I don't want to be in here. There's a middle of the green I'm trying to hit at. So this is where is it like you, you, like if you're, um, an analytical person like myself, you want to get as much data as you can to then make the decision versus someone who is more of a, an emotional player. They, they kind of go off of what they're feeling a little bit more. Yeah, it can. So the feelers are going to be more emotionally uh, intelligent. They're going to drive a lot more off emotional intelligence, which is in golf going to be how your state is or your core, like your solar plexus area down here for a feeler is a really important area because that's really the decider. Let you know if you have peace or if you're kind of uncomfortable, you got a uh, like type of right. feeling. Um, but this would apply to all areas of life. But yeah, so thinking and feeling how it's going to affect in your golf game, it's going to be how you're going to arrive at your decisions and decisions that you trust. Uh, it's going to be how you're going to accept shots in your post shot. Um, and basically your general evaluation, because believe it or not, thinkers and feelers are going to go out and 
evaluate the round much differently. Um, thinkers tend to go out and put task first, people second. When they get stressed, people become dominant and their task, their strategy, getting it done, you know, gets put onto the back burner and it would be a sign of stress. So a and good example like, of that is like worrying about what other people in your group are doing or if someone's, you know, watching you or if they're slow and you're fast. Is that, is that well, kind of you're logical, example? right? So what if somebody's mm -hmm. acting illogically consistently in your group? Now you're away yeah. from, hey, here's what my job is. Here's my responsibilities. And now you're thinking like, mm -hmm. why is that guy doing that? Oh my gosh. Right. And now you're yeah. in your routine and you're like, that guy's still doing that. He's jingling the coins <laughs> in his pocket. Like, you know, and so thinkers will, will drift away from task and go to people. Um, during Tiger's struggle, you could see this. Tiger's a strong thinker, number one mode. Uh, feeling aspects were his least developed function, according to his personality type, ISTP. Well, when he was struggling, what was happening? He was more into worrying about public image and different things that were going wrong. His relationships were struggling. And again, he's more worried about those things and his normal, let's get out and win. And you could see that influencing his performance too. Like even the best in the world can't escape biology. If we're going against that and we're having stress, we're going to see ourselves underperforming. Um, feelers, on the other hand, they really got to start learning to trust their gut. A simple decision, uh, example would be we are now on a par five and the feeler has been struggling with their driver all day, right? And just even thinking about hitting driver on the par five right now is, ugh, you know, like it is not, it doesn't sit right. But when you think about ripping the driving iron out there, really, really comfortable. Now, oftentimes these feelers will go against what their state's saying. So they go, wow, you know, I read all the books. I know the most logical statistical route is, is to pump it up there as far as I can. So, you know what? I'm going to hit driver. And they go against that feeling. Now they pump driver out there. It's their big miss. And they go, why did I hit that? I never felt good. And, and these are some of the challenges that take place. So thinkers, what we need to do, if you want to make a good decision, start looking at percentages. Get to the bottom line. You know, what's the highest percentage, smartest shot? Weigh some pros and cons to arrive at a good decision. If you're a feeler, you want to be asking yourself, what shot, what club do I feel most confident with right now? Like, what am I most confident doing? So if we go, we, we want to start there because that confidence is going to base, you know, the rest of the, the shot process for sure. So what happens with stress? The thinkers are going to start moving away from these logical analytical processes and they're going to start basing it off emotion, mostly frustration. Um, maybe some irritation, right? You, you made a mistake. Now I'm going to hit this shot. I didn't hit yet. Um, I'm going to try to make up for it and feeling players. What they do is they lose touch with their, their core, their state, what their body's telling them to do. And they start trying to get, they get too analytical. So they're going to get paralysis by analysis. They're going to overthink things. The task is going to take precedent over how they feel and, um, their game's going to derail that way. Because again, logically, that might be the right shot, but if they go against their state, it's going to be a poor shot. Again, for you, you know, if you're going against the numbers and you're trying to drive the emotion or change your decisions based on other people, okay? Yeah. You know, That's sometimes you get on that too. par you know, three people, and you're looking around yeah. and uh, you're like, yeah. oh, he's hitting a five iron here. Right. And now you know, and now you're making a decision based off people. That would also be a sign of stress for thinking. Yeah, I, I'm really glad you said that too, because so many people are guilty of that. If you got three wood and everybody's pulling driver or vice versa, and then you start questioning yourself. There is nothing worse than that. You're standing over it. It's like standing over a putt and not committing to a line. You're just, you're never going to make a good effort uh, to it. And so, yeah, that that's why that is so important to know your mental golf type. I mean, that... That's one that I felt guilty of earlier in my tournament days, for sure, is is uh, even though I'm very much a logical player, I didn't realize it in that sense. And I would see everybody else hitting a different club and then and then guys, too. We let ego get in the way. He's hitting five iron. I can hit five iron there. And so, yeah, having uh, having the ability to know your type is so key in, in having the confidence. I feel like half of hitting a good shot or maybe 70 percent is knowing that it's the right club for the shot and knowing you have the right target. 
but too, too many golfers, you know, like we said, will go against their personality type. And then you're standing over that thing without a hundred percent commitment. And that's where a lot of bad, bad shots come from. That's the big miss right there. And, um, it can happen so easy. Um, but yeah, again, if you're a feeler, your body's never going to lie. Trust that over everything. And if the body's mm -hmm. kind of giving you that irk, go to what makes you feel more confident. And if you're a thinker, the numbers never will lie. You know, it's like you're going to trust those numbers. And, you know, if you yeah, can't that's why that I love seven using out of 10 book. or eight out of 10 yeah. in the moment now, mm -hmm. you know, punch out or, you know, get the one that's going to give you the higher percentage. Because again, this is setting the tone for the rest of your routine. Mm -hmm. So if we're not getting to a decision we trust, right, how are we going to feel comfortable at a dress position? Like your mind's still going to be looking to make that decision or it's still looking to solve that to get you into a state of comfort. And so now we're multitasking, mm -hmm. um, not really comfortable. So we're still deciding a little unsure. Now we have to perform. And Just so... Too this funny. I've just seen those examples too many times in my own game. So it's, uh, I'm glad that I'm glad you created this so we can all get a little more structure and understanding of how our mind works. Each well, individual we, mind works. We all have it. And like, I'm not, I can't escape it either because all stress is an automatic response. So it's something that's generated from our subconscious mind. We can do a lot of work to learn how to detect it and identify and work through it. Um, but everybody's going to experience it on some level. And so, um, we just put out that update recently, um, that talks about elevating your ability to detect it because what we need to do out on the course is I need to have the awareness that I'm on that par five and I'm like, you know what? The two iron is the play. And I can trust that because I have this understanding and I'm aware, like <laughs> I'm starting to go that other direction and having that awareness and being able to override it and shift yourself in the right state is, is so important because you're never going to be able to eliminate it. it. It's at best we can start desensitizing areas, building new neural pathways based on how you do things. Um, but there will always be something that will come up eventually through the year that's going to, going to trigger those states. And so, uh, the better equipped you are, you know, the better it is. And then it's a learning process of continuing to look back on rounds, even when we struggled and get educated, take the mistakes, turn them into lessons by understanding, oh, okay, this is what I'm doing. Here's my new route forward. And uh, we have some audio programs too that will help you kind of drive that into your head. So next time in that situation, there's a whole new association and we're going to have a better, a better outcome. Yeah, the uh, the mental fitness, as you call them, programs are fantastic. Guys, if you have mental golf type and you haven't purchased those yet, highly invest in, uh, highly recommend investing in those. It is so good and it is something I've listened to. Even when I don't talk to you for a few weeks, John, you're always always still in my head, programming my mind for greatness on the golf course. So I, I appreciate you. No, oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> One, uh, one, I guess just kind of to pivot, I'm going to have to, we're going to have to go back to the fourth letter on a, maybe a fourth call in the, in the future, just cause, uh, I know we could talk all day about it, but I've had a lot of golfers tell me that they're signing up for tournaments. They're excited for tournaments. I've just brainwashed them into it and they want to test their game this year. You have been a caddy at the highest level of golf tournaments out there. You've been to you know, Corn Ferry. You've been on the PJ Tour. You've been to Q School, which is its own beast in itself. So I would just love to get your take on what the everyday golfer getting into tournaments. Um, you know, I surveyed my audience. I'd say the average score is probably mid 80s, low 80s. Um, and they're really getting excited, but a lot of them feel like they're not good enough to play in tournaments or they don't really know how they should be acting or what, or just are there, I guess they're worried about maybe some sort of imposter syndrome feeling like, you know, am I good enough to be out there? What would you say to guys that are, you know, just getting into tournaments, what, what they can do to get a little more confidence out there? Well, first thing I would say is, is be aware of self-talk. So one of the simplest things is, is we often say, you know, like I'm pretty nervous or I might worry about nerves out there. If, if that's the case, shift it into excitement. The studies show that you're saying I'm excited to go out and play. I'm excited to go and test my abilities. Um, these things will enhance performance by simply shifting that. Um, as far as building confidence, uh, one thing is that you can do right away in any situation is take control of your body language. Because if you're ever lacking confidence or you're finding like your self-talk and things are shifting, uh, the easiest starting point is body language. Um, 
I am under the belief that your body language, emotions, and thoughts work together as one unit. It's like one team. Even though there's different elements, they're all working to stay consistent and congruent. So if you're there and you're feeling like an imposter, well, your body language is probably reflecting imposter syndrome, first off. So no amount of saying, like, I'm confident enough to do that without changing the body language is going to really go in. So starting point, put yourself in practice carrying yourself as you would during those tournament days. Um, practice it at your club, at your range. How are you walking around as a competitive player? Um, it's pretty amazing. You can feel the aura and the presence of the really high level players. I mean, being at the U.S. Open this past year and being around the top 50, um, you can feel them. You can tell just by the way they're carrying their body. Now, you don't have to be, um, you know, put the swagger on to the max like Dustin Johnson or something. <laughs> but if you walk to him, he has such a presence. And everybody has their own expression of body language. You don't have to be military and things, but practice getting into like when you're really feeling confident in life, pay attention to how you're using your body. How are you talking? How are you carrying yourself? Bring that vibe. Practice bringing that because when you get to that first tee box on your first tournament, that's what you want to be turning on. And it isn't for everyone else. It's telling your competitors around you like, yeah, this guy looks like he knows what he's doing. It's for you because you're sending different signals to your brain. You're going to accept different self-talk. You're going to accept different emotions inside of yourself just by the way you're carrying yourself. Um, and then work on maintaining that because uh, you hit that first tee shot poorly. Don't now like suddenly give up on it. It's It's something you want to be proactively doing because it will keep you in the right place uh, and it'll keep you like – keeping you to your responsibilities and what your commitments are. Um, other than that, um, outside of knowing some of your mental golf type keys that we might key a player in on to just kind of keep them in their zone, um, the thing that we get across to a lot of our teams is the three Ps. Um, we're really looking to win the three Ps. And this helps put you back into a locus of control. And the, and the three Ps are positive, patient, and process. Now, you can look at the three Ps all as one sentence, a positive patient process, you know, like those are good. That will take you uh, to a really high level. But we're looking to win in these three areas. So, one, we want to be the most positive person we can on the golf course. And positivity is going to come out in different ways for different people. Um, if you have a, a strong feeling type, um, depending upon personality, ESFJ, like my mother, um, her emotions are out there. I mean, she is really positive. You can tell, like, she comes across very joyful. Not everybody is going to express positivity that way. Tiger Woods is a very positive person, but you wouldn't tell when he's in his competitive mode. You look like he's, mm. you know, he's really intense. So for a lot right. of thinkers, positivity comes in the way of how are you directing your mind on your decisions? Are you maintaining self-efficacy? right? Like the belief that I can get the job done. For feelers, your attitude and being positive is a number one key to your success. Um, all your feeling players that are listening to this program, I challenge you, have you played a good round of golf and shot really low, been in a negative, having been in a negative state? Mm. And I haven't really come across one. And if it is, it's a, such an exception to the rule. So again, for a feeler, attitude, that relationship, you to you, number one. But this is the first thing we're trying to win. Let's be the most positive. This is a separator. Um, being positive is a sign of mental toughness. It's easy to be negative. It takes so much less effort to allow negative ideas to go in because it doesn't take effort to accept that. Right. But to be positive takes effort. It, it takes some work, but it is a defining and separating factor with top performers. Next thing we want to be is patient. Patience is huge. This is going to be in your post shot, allowing the round to unfold, um, being patient after any mistakes. Patience is key. When you listen to anything around the majors, one of the things you always hear the commentators talk about, one of the things you'll always hear come up consistently in interviews, stay patient, staying patient, staying patient. Another way of saying is being present. Um, but I think patience is, is huge. Now, a lot of people, when they're getting in the tournaments, they feel like they got to fire at every pin. They got to play aggressive. They got to, they got to jump on every opportunity. 
and that's not the case. Like some of our game plans when I'm going out, we are, we are game plan is always to make six birdies. We want to be six under or better. We tend to set birdie goals. But we please, know, please elaborate on that because I had that on my list of questions that I forgot to ask because I have not been able to elaborate that well. And you told me that about six months ago, maybe. And I five to six is my goal, depending on the course and the setup. And I love chasing that. Why is a birdie goal so much better than a score goal? Sorry, I had to segue because oh, I love that goal. No problem. Well, I think birdie goals are better than score goals because, again, when you look at a score or a number, it's it's a conflict for both types of focus, sensors or intuitive. So for me, I go, well, I want to shoot a 72, let's say. I'm going to break, I'm going to shoot par. My mind goes, well, like, how the heck does that even come about? Like, I know I can't visualize a perfect round of golf because it's never going to come out that way, but I still want to visualize. I still want to kind of get to that, right? So again, it's intangible. So now my mind doesn't know. I go out to the course and I'm trying to hit this number. Now I start off with a bogey. Oh, shoot. Well, now I got to press or now I'm three behind. And next thing you know, I'm derailed. It's like, oh, that's out of reach now, let's say. And this is for most people. And, and for sensors, again, it's like, it's like doing algebra. It's like, how do I get there? It, the mind just stays confused. And so all it is is an anxiety producer, in my opinion. Now you look at your, one of your tournament courses and you go, okay, my, my goal is six birdies. Well, we can already just look at the handicap of the hole and already look at where are real opportunities right away. You look at those, the higher handicap holes right off the bat. Those are going to be some easy opportunities. Well, maybe that doesn't set up right for your hole. Like you play a cut, it's a draw hole. So maybe that's not the case, but you can start formulating a plan in your brain. Like three is gettable, six is gettable, seven is gettable. Um, now we can start playing out this strategy in my mind. I can start seeing this coming into being when I'm looking at a birdie goal. So that's one reason. The other thing is, is well, again, like going back to the earlier example, if I'm getting far off on my number, I'm out. Like if it's 72 now, I'm making the turn and I'm way out of it. I, I it's going to be hard to battle back from that. With a birdie goal, no matter where we're at, it's almost like a match play mentality. I can still be pursuing my birdie goal. I can still get to that next tee and go, okay, I still want to get my five birdies. I have a couple opportunities and now I'm starting to get back into my process and my plan to accomplishing that. And so that's some of the short reasons on why I like birdie goals. And going back to the patience, we understand that the way the tournament pins will be and the way the setups will be that we're likely to have 12 putts from about 20 to 30 feet. That's, it's going to happen. And we're looking to manufacture like six, really tight birdie looks to convert. Um, and that's how we stay patient. So if we, you know, we're on the first hole and we, we hit it, we're fairway green, but we're 25 feet. We're looking for birds and tappings. That's our mentality. We have, we have this little line, this little mantra. We go birds and taps and tap and birdies. And um, that's kind of how we play. So we're staying patient. We're not going to go after an aggressive pin uh, or something we shouldn't and get short-sighted. Uh, again, we have that decision we could do, but we elect to stay patient and go, okay, this could be one of our 12. Now we, we practice a lot from that range with putting. So it should be a tap in par, you know, bird, it's a birdie or a tap in. So we're good with that. It's going to keep us right in the mix all the time. And finally process. I mean, here's again, these are your three responsibilities. If we hit these things, being positive with our decision making, our attitude, staying patient, allowing the round to unfold, um, taking the opportunities on the fives, on those ones that are set up really well for ourselves, and then driving in a good process number. Um, so process is all we really talk about goal wise. We set outcome goals at the head of the week. You know, like we want to win. We're out there to win. We have our, our birdie target number. But then like our, our round, our game within the game, if you will, is we want 95% processes. 95% number will win the tournament if we can do that over the course of the week. Um, but our fallback. And by number, processes, you, know, you mean for the moon. Yeah. Processes, you mean being 95% committed and have the right club and the right thinking process for the shots, like your routine number. 
your routine number yeah and, and for us it's like it's mgt specific so like are we mm -hmm. doing exactly what we need to do to create an environment in our brain and body to produce the best of our physical ability and that comes from working through your consistency formula knowing how you're making your decisions how you're preparing where that focus needs to be um so yeah, that's what we're tracking, but it could just be commitment. I mean, even if you don't have a doubt in like that, it can be, you know, good committed, uh, good decision, good commitment to the shot. But that's what we're, we're putting our active focus out there. We're not chasing score. We're not worrying about score. It's our question is always like, did you deliver the check mark there? Did we get another mm -hmm. process there? In my opinion, these are your three things that are your direct responsibility as a player out on the course. If you do these three things really well and to the best of your ability, you're going to have lights out rounds all the time. doesn't mean you have to hit it perfect. In fact, people learn how staying out of stress and abiding and winning those three P's. You can have your C and D game ball striking wise, but you can still find a way to score with the right mentality and taking advantage of those opportunities with, with being patient. Those are the those are the most fun rounds too. Just slapping it around, and you're still beating your competitors. I uh, I, I loved it. You just grind people down. They're like, "How are you under par right now?" I I had two of those rounds last year, and it was pretty. And that happens. Pretty, and it's pretty happening fun. more yeah. for you because you're managing your stress, so you're mm -hmm. not unraveling and going down those rabbit holes on the golf course. And then you're doing a really good job managing the golf course, and mm -hmm. and those things are key. Right there. Do you guys uh, check the leaderboard or is that something I know some players love to, some players don't? What's your strategy there? Uh, you know what? It's it's mixed. I mean, I don't think if you're going to be a competitive player, you can shy away from looking at where you're at. I mean, in every other sport, the scoreboard's right in front of you, so you got to get comfortable with that. But again, the challenge that golfers have is they just stay in the fantasy, like lingering around in the score, how you're going to do that in the next couple of holes – it's just an illusionary world. It's it's fantasy. It's speculative. So we try to poke the hole in that little thought bubble as quick as we can and go, okay, yeah, that's great. We need to get three to come in. How are we going to do that? We're going fairway green and we're going to have really good processes on these next three holes. We're going to Honda, we're going to get a hundred percent on these next three. And so again, we go from the outcome and always bringing it back to direct control and what we're directly responsible for. And so, um, there are times that we didn't, um, look at the board. Um, so if you're, we just would let our, our tea time sometimes determine <laughs> where we were. Um, uh, we knew like, Hey, we had a late time. So we're, we're right in the mix. Um, yeah. but for us, it doesn't matter. It comes down to we're confident that if we deliver what we've worked on, over the course of four days and we're hitting it at that level, we're going to be right where we want to be. doesn't mean we're always going to win, but we, our goal is to be very competitive. And in our opinion, that's how we be competitive. Like we're doing our job. Now you, you got us that week, Michael, we tip our cap because we didn't leave it out there. We didn't give it to you. We weren't self-defeating and getting into our own way. And so we leave confident and we look back at that tournament and say, yeah, it was a good week and we'll see you next week. Um, there's a big difference with that than getting in your way, sabotaging kind of your own round, whether we're getting negative or going into stress or, you know, allowing some errors to derail us. Um, those rounds you leave there and you're like, man, it just doesn't feel good. You left it out there with the score. Uh, you know, you just left it out there mentality wise. And that's what we're working. We're just wanting to be competitive. And so for us, like those, the birdie goals and the three Ps, um, you know, my, my players have always found like that makes them pretty tough out there. Love that. Thank you for uh, finally elaborating that. I've been telling everybody to do it, but I can't explain why. Because <laughs> I was like, John said to do it and I've been playing really good. So that's what you should do too. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and be uh, ambitious. And you know, if you're not, yeah. if you're not like a scratch player, or you're, you're not making a lot of And you can set par buddies, goals too. Set par yeah. goals, and and change the self talk. You know, my dad passed away last month, but he is my favorite golfer because my dad had Parkinson's. I mean, his swing was never pre. I mean, he was following your book. You know, improve your score without changing your swing, and he just loved mental golf type. I mean, he he dove all into that. Uh, I'm kind of forgetting where I was, was going with that. Um, 
shoot. We were just I talking mean, about uh, just birdie goals and and scoring oh, well, and setting oh, par goals. So I would call my dad all the time because he's the biggest golf fan I've ever known. And he we would dive into some session work. And I was working with this one pro who's like transitioning through Q school and things. And um, we were talking about like, you know, you're a birdie machine. You should be able to say that. Be comfortable making birdies. This is why you're working so hard is like make birdies and know that's normal and natural, right? Um, and my dad would listen to that. He goes, he started playing really good golf. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, you know what? He's like, I'm a par guy. He's like, I got a par guy and I can, I can tap some birdies in there too, but I know I can make pars and bogeys and stuff. He, and he goes, I work really hard on that. And he minimized his big numbers. His, his, his big number avoidance went down so much and, um, his scoring got better. And that's a lot of it just changed from the self talk, starting to think like, Hey, I'm capable of making birdie here or par here and I don't have to be super great. Our whole mentality is, is what's the most stress-free way to get to that 20-foot, 30-foot scoring zone where it's a bird and tap in? And my dad says, I can do that. I'm a par guy, I, you know, and, and that affected even him. And it can help any golfer regardless of where your level is. Now, consistency matters, though. You know, if you ever employ anything with self-talk, you get out there and you're trying to think positive or encourage yourself and it doesn't go your way and you just bail out on it. Um, it's, it's always going to be ineffective because the habitual thoughts are negative, but he started driving that in, driving that in, driving that in. Next thing you know, scoring average change, he was league champ. And that's awesome. And this is how it, it, it can work for everybody out there. So if you're getting into the competitive environment, say, Hey, I'm, I'm a competitor. Start driving into self-talk, use your body language and be yourself out there, you know? I I tell all the pros, hey, your name's on the bag for a reason. Trust what got you there. And if you're considering being a competitive player, trust your game, be yourself, and that's going to bring about the most confidence and the best performance for you. Love it. And uh, my goal now is to make it to a USGA event one day and have you on the bag. I feel like we're, <laughs> I mean, just start putting the name on the name on the trophy with you there because that would be that would be epic. So I got I got something on the vision board now. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. I'm excited to <laughs> really get there one day. One day, one day. So uh, for my last question, and uh, guys, make sure again, if you have not taken your free mental golf type uh, assessment, do it now so you can learn these things. It has absolutely changed my game. I've talked about it extensively. There's a reason John was the most shared episode last year. Um, and there's a reason mental golf type is exploding all over the world, which is fantastic. So make sure to download that. The app is great as well. Congrats on that. Um, and for the last question, what is the difference you would say, aside from technical and swing uh, stuff, from uh, the best players when you're out there on the professional golf versus the everyday golfers that you're seeing? What is uh, maybe the mental difference or maybe the one thing? Uh, maybe we've already covered it, too, but just so you feel like, wow, if, if the everyday player could adopt what these guys are doing in tournaments, um, aside from a perfect swing, uh, what would really help their scores? Um, you know, it's. The, the big separator is kind of like what we talked about. It's, it's really the process number. So when we're mm -hmm. looking at transitioning through that threshold, it's who can put themselves in the condition to bring out that great swing more consistently. Right. Um, because when you look up and down the line at Q school, uh, everybody's got the game. They're all very talented. They all bust it out there. But what is different between the guys who make it out there? And, and really it comes down to process numbers. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you're below that 93% number, we're not going to make the jump through Q school, um, because that's the threshold. They can do that nine out of 10 times or better. And if you're a player who's doing that at seven out of 10 or eight out of 10, it's just not good enough. Like how, how do you spot a guy, even two shots like John Rahm uh, each round, right? Over four days, that's eight shots. You're spotting one of the best players in the world because mentally he's going to be there and he's going to put himself into a position to release the best of his physical talents. And that's what they're doing more consistently. Um, that and belief systems, um, they have a lot of, they're very honest with themselves, um, with where they're at in their games and everything. And they have a great self image. And so they're able to get feedback and not take it as an attack or criticism. They're able to take good feedback, be self-honest with themselves and give themselves good feedback and take action on it rather than 
you know, getting them stressed and run to the couch or demotivate them or see it as an attack and, and stop. So self honesty and a lot of self confidence. And so when I see when players are able to take that feedback and do that, it's showing a high level of confidence and a self image of a, of a high productive player. Yeah, I've, I've been to Q School just to watch and just the sound on the range is pretty, pretty inspiring. You just close your eyes and hear pure golf shot after pure golf shot. It's just, uh, it's beautiful. It is beautiful until it's like in the afternoon and you get on the range at Q School and it's those guys There's, with is there dreams any grass on left? the line and <laughs> they're there trying to figure things out. And that is a, that is a, a tense place to be. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't even imagine. Well, thank you as always, John, for being a part of Wicked Smart Golf, sharing all your wisdom. And uh, we just appreciate you tons for everything you're doing with Mental Golf Type and helping everybody play better by finally understanding their own minds. No, thank you. It was a joy to be back here.